What does AI mean to you? Well, I work in uh, Silicon Valley, actually. How will it change your world? I, I work in uh, big data systems, and we, mm -hmm. the, at least the company that I work for, uh, we make the computational platform that mm -hmm. um, AI and machine learning runs on. My job is to essentially automate other people's jobs. Uh, but at some point, you know, I might automate my own job away. And yeah. we're already starting to see some of those effects. Like my mom, she was uh, forced to go into early retirement because mm -hmm. her job at the hospital was replaced by a robot, essentially. Oh. Um, but I guess I'm mostly concerned about my son. Because the more the more I work in this field, uh, the more concern mm -hmm. I get. The more concern I get. Hey guys. Hey. How's it going? I say it's so late. We gotta figure out what's happening. So uh, we've been seeing that uh, the like th there's something wrong with the infrastructure here, and uh, from what from what I see on the I charts of the cluster, problem. from what I see on the it's charts on the not cluster, an infrastructure problem. Can I complete it wrong with the disk usage and the memory usage? No. So I look at the logs, right? I figure out that the cluster. Why did we have so many problems? Why can't my team work together? Why am I wasting my life here? That night was a breaking point for me. I needed to escape. I met the trekking company in Tbilisi, in the Republic of Georgia, after a nerve-wracking ride in an old Soviet-style flatbed with absolutely nothing to hang on to. The journey officially began in a shepherd's hut at the edge of Samogrelo National Park. The guide told me that it was too late in the year, and we may run into inclement weather in the mountains. As a completely green trekker, I was very anxious about the 70 kilometers of mountainous passage that lay ahead. <laughs> the only thing that distracted me from my worries was the aroma of the rustic shepherd's breakfast simmering on the small stove. How do you say cheese in Georgian? In the age of processed foods, it was rare for me to have something so fresh and so unique. 
<laughs> Our group consisted of 10 people from all over the world in all walks of life. Trekkers of varying degrees of experience, guides from Tbilisi, and local nomads who only spoke Megrelian. Nick was the lead guide who served in the Soviet Red Army for years as a Mountain Corps instructor. He was a fountain of knowledge about the Caucasus. Nita and Helen were experienced trekkers and came well prepared. Sholta was a Georgian grad student studying microbiology. He was soft-spoken and knew a lot about the surrounding flora and fauna. I've never seen so many different shades of green, but it immediately made me breathe deep and feel relaxed. This is no accident. 99.5% of human evolution is about the need to survive in a natural environment dominated by green. So our eyes are specifically adapted to be able to distinguish hundreds of shades of greens. A veteran trekker, Jackson told me to keep focusing on breathing and to go at my own pace. I would ignore this sage advice to my own detriment. Soon, I found myself thoroughly exhausted and incredibly thankful that Irakli was far ahead and already made camp. All the surveillance oh, have any secrets left or <laughs> well, well everything all of his dirty laundry would be aired out on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. Um, no, I'm very afraid. Will he have a job, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with all this automation going on? Ah, uh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, so part, and that's part of the reason why I'm here. You know, he's just eight months old. Will he, he have any privacy left? You know, what's the world going to be like for him? <笑>这个是欧洲低高峰呃鄂尔布鲁斯哦呃海拔呢应该是五千我记得应该是五千六百四十二米哇那它它是在俄罗斯境内不是不对不在格鲁加境内哈哈哈哈哈哈哈哈
AI is now being applied everywhere, without people realizing it. In the hands of big tech, it is being used to track our activities. It affected elections and enabled the spread of hate. In the hands of government, it is being deployed in law enforcement without public review. Predictive policing was hyped as an oracle of justice. Instead, it merely deepened systemic racism. Real-time facial recognition is being used across Asia and Europe to enable comprehensive surveillance from which there is no escape. The fog finally lifted, and the view opened up into a beautiful rolling hillside, flanked by a small stream breathing life into all around it. I had no idea where I was heading, and I was too tired to look in front of my path. An unexpected tumble hurt just my pride, and I pressed on. In 1938, a German Z1 was the first programmable computer ever built. It was capable of one cycle per second. In 2019, the Summit supercomputer reached 122 petaflops. That's 122 billion, billion floating point operations per second. In one human lifetime, we've gone from the first computer the computing power almost beyond comprehension. Transhumanist Ray Kurzweil predicted that by 2045, AI will become self-aware. How long before we become machines that need to be fixed and upgraded? How long before Cybermen from Doctor Who go from science fiction to world history? Even before that juncture, what will AI have automated away? Will my son have a job? Will anyone? I could no longer tell whether it was the fog or my anxieties that made it hard to breathe. How long? How long? Probably three hours. 三个小时，我也，我也累了。再坚持坚持。三个小时，没问题。Shota explained to me that the clean smell of the mountain came from negative ions. In the environment, negative ions remove allergens from the air that we breathe. In the human body. It helps the production of serotonin, the feel-good hormone. At high altitudes or near bodies of water, negative ions occur naturally in greater concentrations. And that partially explains why being in nature often helps to elevate the mood.
All I could think about was how cold and exhausted I was. As I reached camp, I was shivering all over and started to run a fever. Our guides rushed to my aid to help me change out of the sweaty layers now draining my body of heat. I could barely put down some hot tea and soup before retiring to my tent. While I turned and tossed that night, I heard our guides walk around every few hours to shake the snow from our tents. Now from now it's a bit lighter and I very much hope that it will stop soon. So uh, let's see how it will uh, be tonight, but yeah, I hope we will be fine to walk over the pass. I'm a naturally competitive person. I felt so embarrassed that I was so physically underprepared for this environment. This is what happens when man loses touch with nature. It was not an easy night, but everybody survived. So no one is frozen, <laughs> which is good. Uh, so today is a bit better, but we still uh, need to change some plans, uh, which we planned originally because of the snow. And uh, so today we will uh, we have to do the same, cross this pass, which is uh, 2,780 uh, meters. So the snow on the pass will be much deeper than here, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, might be half a meter, even more. So we have to work as a team <laughs> to yeah, get okay, the horses okay. and everybody because yeah, yeah. it might yeah, yeah, yeah. be mm -hmm. quite difficult for yeah. the horses because this pass will be impossible to cross. Okay. And also then we have to cross another pass which will be also impossible mm -hmm. to cross. Mm -hmm. I don't think it will be sunshine. Climb through the snow challenged my body like nothing before. 
but I had to prove to myself that I could reach the summit. So, I persevered. Almost there. Little by little, the snow melted, and tiny bits of green started to peek through. The beauty of the forest below and the harshness of the mountain above made me think of a famous chapter from the Tao Te Ching. Zhi ren zhe zhi, zhi ji zhe ming, sheng ren zhe you li, sheng ji zhe qiang, zhi zu zhe fu. 强行者有志，不失其所者久，死而不亡者寿。I've never been able to sit still for meditation, but at that moment, I was in a walking trance that must have been somewhere close to a state of Zen.
，才发现能活了下来，这么开心。没雪，没雪，真是太舒服了，感觉。他这个地方，这个我刚才问了一下，他这的雪线跟这个中国喜马拉雅山不太一样，他是三千米就雪线。三千米就雪线，对，好像五百多。今天晚上咱们就到那个公园那儿。哇，那那个地方可以烤火。<笑>这我那帐篷，我那睡袋都湿了。今天晚上我是睡，前这两天睡冷死了。<笑>我那放大镜。On the way down, I found some wild berries. They tasted incredible, sweeter than anything bought in the store. Refreshed and warmed up, our spirits picked up as we descended. Soon, we started to see signs of human settlement again. That night, we set up camp near another group of nomads. <laughs> yeah. Did you find it hard to trek up there? Yeah, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done, for sure. Well, uh, which part was the hardest for you? Um, I would definitely have to say, uh, I think it was day three when we had to make it over the pass to the lake. Uh. Um, you know, I learned the literal meaning of dragging my feet as I totally ran out of energy, and then by the time mm -hmm. I got to the tent, I was in hypothermia. And it took really? me a long time to, to recover. After all the snow and cold and fog. Really nice. Absolutely. We often think of trees as solitary and passive life forms, but biologists have discovered a wood-wide web of mycelium just beneath the Earth's surface. Plants can use this interconnected network of fungi to transport nutrients like carbon, nitrogen, or phosphorus. They can use it to communicate about diseases or parasites to neighbors. They can even use it for sabotage by releasing harmful chemicals into their environment. Shalta told me about how trees can generate energy fields and interact with each other invisible to the human eye. I thought he had finally eaten the wrong type of mushroom. Until he took out his phone and showed me some amazing images captured by the Miracam, which is able to show energy fields in action. Tutti gli esseri viventi emettono campi elettromagnetici. Possiamo considerare l'elettromagnetismo come il linguaggio fondamentale della biologia, 
un linguaggio che permette di comunicare effettivamente tra tutti gli esseri viventi e all'interno di ciascun organismo vivente delle informazioni. Questo ci permette ad esempio di raccogliere informazioni da un albero e queste informazioni hanno un effetto su tutto il nostro corpo, su tutti i nostri organi, in una misura che può essere differente da specie a specie. Però vedi che, che, che sta lavorando sul cuore? Sì. Perché quel punto lì è un punto bianco. L'albero sembra perdere energia e in realtà cede energia che viene assorbita dal corpo. Ok, should we continue? Oh, you. It was almost like nature had its own natural intelligence. All of these complex systems have achieved a dynamic equilibrium over eons of evolution. But artificial intelligence have had only a few decades. How will it establish a new equilibrium in the world? What would the impact be on human society? Who would be guiding this process? While I still had questions, I wasn't feeling so worried or pessimistic anymore. has arrived and the drivers are offered us. Cool. Mm, this is delicious. Good to have some in the end of the tour. <laughs> yeah. So we're going back to Tbilisi today? Yeah. And it is the last day. I'm really going to miss looking at those mountains. Two months later, I went to the UK to meet with Professors Floridi and Bostrom at Oxford University. not only will survive any potential or uh, nightmarish uh, taking over of technology, there is no such thing as a taking over of technology. And therefore, the answer is obviously yes. Uh, it will be like saying, are we going to survive our, our worst nightmares? Yes, we are, because they are nightmares. Uh, they're not real. At the same time, there is something important to be stressed. Those nightmares do present some view of a potential world 
that we might be uh, mistakenly building. But let's not forget, it is up to us, and these are mere fictional worries that we are creating for ourselves. <laughs> What is consciousness? To be conscious, you have to be intelligent, but being intelligent is not enough. The consciousness that we are talking about here is human consciousness. We don't find that anywhere else. So maybe consciousness could be defined, among many other ways, in the following sense. It's the ability to ask questions about oneself. The intelligent animal doesn't ask questions about its own intelligence. Is AI consciousness? How is it different from the self-awareness of humans? An artificial intelligence system, as we know it today, uh, is a piece of software uh, that transforms some data into some information which we find useful. I think we should uh, remain realistic about this and understand that, of course, this is amazing. Of course. There will be plenty of tasks that will be taken over by these machines. But we should not be mistaken about the nature of the machines and what's really going on here. In other words, there is no comparison between an uh, intelligent, conscious human uh, being and a gadget, a piece of software, uh, a computer or maybe a, a neural network that transforms some patterns into some other patterns and maybe having seen thousands of pictures of a cat will actually recognize that as a cat. Well, that's extraordinary and uh, is testimony to the immense intelligence that has gone into it, but it's human intelligence, and there is no shred of artificial intelligence as per Hollywood definition. When it comes to our self-understanding, uh, trying to understand who are we, uh, who we can become, there have been four revolutions. The first one was uh, the Copernican Revolution. We thought we were important because we were at the center of the universe. And it was a very comfortable place where to be. But then Copernicus came and put us on a small planet, uh, going around a quite smallish sun in a small galaxy in the middle of nowhere. That was uh, disappointing, uh, so we retrenched uh, and decided, well, at least in these circumstances, on this planet, we are at the center of the animal kingdom, the biosphere. Well, then Darwin came and actually displaced us from their centrality as well. Uh, it reminded us that we are part of a, a larger uh, evolution uh, and there are lots of similarities between us and, say, the, the apes or, or other animals. So we retrenched once again. Uh, there was a, a third centrality that we wanted to keep, essentially the centrality within our mental space. And the third revolution was caused by Freud who told us that uh, well, there are lots of things we are not aware of, that our mind is not like a, a box within which we can identify exactly what's going on, that a lot of the things that we decide about, we fear, we hope for, have been determined by many things we are not conscious. And so that centrality was also lost. There was one last point that we could still defend. We thought we were at the center of the infosphere of the space of information. We were the only ones who could play chess, land an aircraft, or buy the cheapest fridge online. They could exchange and manipulate and uh, make money out of the stock exchange. Well, then Turing came, uh, and what we are undergoing now is a fourth revolution. We're not at the center of the infosphere. Uh, we are, in fact, part of a larger uh, environment where lots of other agents, mostly artificial, sometimes social, are interacting with us, instead of us, better than us. That fourth revolution should really make us reconsider our importance in the universe. We are important not because we are the center, but because we can serve the universe. It's not because the party is ours that we are so crucial and so important, but because we can organize the party for the other, and the other being the world surrounding us. It is important to realize that we are part of a much, much bigger picture, that we are nodes of our wider network, that we are made by all the links that constitute this particular node. In this sense, it will be almost like a roundabout where many roads meet and the roundabout exists 
because the roads exist. In other words, the individual, me, you, uh, we exist because of all the rest of the universe uh, being there, uh, meeting at this particular point. This point in question has boundless potential and uh, should probably spend some of that potential making sure that all the links, all the relations, the features that make us human are well taken care of. These are extraordinary times and there is an amazing opportunity in front of us. The opportunity is to go full circle. You know when you walk and you go round and round and round and round and round and then you end up in the same place. Maybe it's a walk in a, in a park or in a, in a wood. What's the point? You start from a place and in the end you get to the same place. Isn't that silly? It's not. That walk, which we can call, for example, technology, science, understanding, uh, something better for us and for the world, is enriching. The fact that we end up, hopefully, having a great connection with the world, with nature, with the environment around us, both human-made and natural, at the end of this long journey, will mean that we'll have been successful in greeting the world, in uh, getting in touch with the world. So hopefully we will be back exactly where we started, but with the extra wonderful enriching experience of knowing that we can be a community, we can cooperate with each other, we can be in synergy with the world around us. If we want to save the future for humanity and save this planet, that is the walk we need to take. We need to start now, but we need to end exactly where we started, part of nature for nature. Next, I went to Professor Bostrom. Given the name of the Institute, I was also curious about his view on the future of humanity. We started by discussing our relationship with nature. I think um, we have this tendency to romanticize nature or to view nature through the lens of human experience. So we think forests are beautiful and wondrous places because all the different species and the tightly woven ecosystem. Um, but I think there's a different perspective that uh, we should also bear in mind, which is nature seen through the lens of the people who live there and the animals that live there. So uh, a, a lot of animals that actually inhabit nature might see nature as this horrible place of scarcity where it's cold and where there is insufficient food and where there are dangers lurking everywhere. I think that the cognitive capacities that the average human has today are higher than at any point in the past. Um, it is true that at the moment there is maybe selection in some ways going in the opposite direction in that it has at least been the case for a number of decades now that uh, say more educated people have fewer children on average. So it's not the only way that things can change. Things can also change, for example, by somebody having a, a plan of where they want to go and then implementing changes to get to that outcome in talent and design. So when we humans are building some technological system, uh, a lot of what goes into that is this intelligent design where we have some plans, some objective, and then work to make it happen. So it's possible that although there will be a lot of change in the future, it will not be evolutionary change, but instead change brought about as the result either of intelligent design or of the various unintended consequences of our efforts 
to design things and achieve various goals. Um, and I think that the uh, upshot of all of that is that the human condition as we know it um, might be transformed into some other condition. Either we could go extinct, we might become post-human, that might be a world dominated by artificial superintelligence. As he spoke, I couldn't help but imagine each one of our brains as a tiny light bulb, all drooping from the Christmas tree. Consciousness might predominantly be instantiated inside um, computers in the future with greater efficiency. Either by, say, uploading human minds by scanning particular brains and then implementing the same computational structure in, in a computer and also maybe by creating de novo new kinds of minds, but digital minds um, that can then either interact with physical reality using some kind of robots or, or maybe for the most part rather living in virtual realities. At the moment, still, um, the notion of superintelligence is su most people really sort of science fiction -y. like it's a kind of thing that doesn't feel quite real. Um, and I think it's going to start feeling more real to more people, and that's going to draw more focus on that. Far from settling the question, the two professors gave strongly opposite views from each other. So my search for answers continued. I haven't been back to Beijing in more than a decade. So I was really looking forward to seeing some very different perspectives. Hi, 呃，有一份统计报告呢，呃，大概预测说在二零三零年，呃，因为人工智能带来的这个GDP的这个产值的增长会达到呃十五万亿美元，呃，这是一个什么概念呢？呃，它大约相当于这个西方国家的呃GD
呃等等几个关系的这几个最重要的关系的呃这种和谐共存当中，可以很好的得以这个存续和发展。王院长，我有很多问题想请教您。第一个就是您对人工智能是怎么理解的？社长，我就特别高兴能见到你，因为很多很多年以前，我已经开始思考你现在思考的问题。我跟你也同样的担心，到底人工智能对人类和人类社会意味着什么？我妈妈是在银行工作，做一名会计。你知道的，每一年的年底要做年结。在我很小的时候，年结是用算盘，由两百多人打出来的。我曾经有一次去接我妈妈，我听到了一两百人在一个大厅里面打算盘的声音，给我留下了非常非常深刻的印象。终于有一天。我妈妈很早就回来了，五六点钟就下班了。我问我妈妈，说你今天为什么回来这么早？她说都是因为 IBM 的计算机。我们今现在用计算机来做年结了。当时我在 IBM 工作，我特别骄傲。但是这个时候，我也产生了一个担心。我问我妈，我说你确定计算机算的是对的吗？我妈说。不用担心，我们有手工账。今天虽然结完了，但是接下来我们会用一两个星期的时间，再用算盘啊，是计算器，把整个的再打一遍，确保计算机算的是对的。我放心了。然而，五年以后，当我再问我妈，我说还有手工账，我妈说没有。我说为什么？他说：“我们相信计算机算的是对的。”在那一刹那，我就开始担心，人类是不是已把已经把一部分的控制真的交给了一个机器系统？我在 IBM 工作，我知道计算机的程序里面可能有差错，叫 bug。社长，我觉得。我还是算一个乐观主义者，不能说是一个悲观主义者，啊，因为其实，如果我们回顾人类的发展历史，人类曾经面对过几次重大的这样的变革，啊，最近的一次，比如说工业文明，那么当时的这个火车。就曾经让很多的偏远地方的部落感觉非常的紧张，他们甚至誓死捍卫他们的领地，而不让火车开进来。然而，火车是一定会开进来的。在火车开进去以后，是很多的文化发生了改变，但人类并没有因此而变得更加不好。With a few days to myself, I decided to go visit a friend in Heilongjiang, the northeastern tip of China. I saw construction everywhere along the way, and workers erecting new buildings at breakneck pace. It was clear that the train I was riding wasn't the only high-speed marvel in China. I've always wanted to see the Winter Festival in Harbin, 
As I walked through the Harbin Ice Festival, I was amazed by all the wonderful sculptures. I was equally dismayed the more selfie sticks than people actually enjoying the moment. Since the first iPhone, smartphones have completely changed our way of life. AI is going to have an even bigger impact on the world. Will we all just quietly pass by? Too distracted to protect our own future? As I walked through the ice Orthodox churches, I thought I would take this opportunity to ask what ordinary folks thought about AI. I was happy to see that China's rapid rise did not leave this remote village behind. And it seemed like people still live very peaceful and content lives. What?
These villagers seem pretty optimistic about AI. Well, at least they didn't seem very worried. I went to interview an expert on Taoism. What could be more interesting than getting the most non-technical take on this most technical subject? We praise to Thakai. He will hear our cry. Bring peace to this place. Just follow Taoism. Hey, 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 hey. Tao教的角度来说，您是怎么看待人工智能这项科技的出现和兴起呢？ 呃，这个人工智能，那么我认为它是人类发明的，呃，人类制造的。那么从这个意义上讲，它想超出人类的控制是非常难的啊。呃，咱问题是，呃，这种高智能，呃，掌握在什么人的手里？中国人最最慎重
，这个道家思想是个自然思想，它是因为道发自然啊。那么人类的一切活动，它都叫人为。那么天地自然的运化，这才是最重要的。人类一切人为，它超出超脱不了天地这个大造化。嗯，谢谢。嗯，好。I am not a religious person. I am not a mystic. But I had to admit, the Taoist words made me think. At the end of the day, AI is created by humans, and humans are still very insignificant in the grand scheme of the universe. The key, he said, was who controlled AI. So is AI just another technological invention, like the car? The airplane, or the computer? Perhaps we've all been so anxious about the technology itself, when we should have been more worried about whose hands we put this technology in. It's ironic that while Chinese netizens increasingly live exclusively within a walled garden, they're also more plugged in than ever before. AI is becoming better and better, not just in the online world, but also at connecting the virtual with the physical. Even as the world economy has become incredibly intertwined, we're becoming more and more isolated from each other. Remember, freedom is the right of all sentient beings. Professor Flaherty said I had to circle back to the same place I started. So I decided to visit the real source of all of our worries about AI, Hollywood. I feel like 
You know, they're gonna take over the world and it's got, not gonna leave any room for us humans. You know, like with the intelligence, uh, and technology wise, like we may not have a job. Like some people may not have a job. We'll just be able to click a little button or whatever. That's how, that's my opinion. And then again, with my opinion, I, it's like a 50-50 with me. For one, it's taking, I believe it's gonna take away like jobs for us. And then again, it's kind of helping us out because in the, nowadays, the newer generation, that's all they're going to know is like robots. They're getting technology at what, the age of two now? I have a little sister, she already not opened open the phone at the age of three. So I think it's like a right. bad impact, but it's not, it, it's going to hurt us physically. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> what they said. <laughs> okay. AI for me, I feel like it has a lot of good properties. I feel like it can be used for a lot of good things. But I feel like there's always like that fear of it being like sentient and being self-aware that it can like, like start like self-replicating and creating more of itself. It's just kind of scary because like I watch a lot of movies and like Terminator and I don't want the world to end. You know? uh, I'm scared. No, I'm actually excited to see um, what new things will, will come from it. Well, I'm not entirely sure what it is, but I think there's enough things in the world to be afraid of without adding new ones. You know? Once I returned home, I finally had a chance to talk with Professor Jerry Kaplan. With decades of experience in technology, entrepreneurship, and artificial intelligence, I was very eager to hear his point of view. Thanks, uh, my point. AI seems to be developing very rapidly, at least from what you hear in the media. Uh, you know, uh, why should I care, and how much should I care, and what really should I care about? Well, it's helpful to understand, first of all, what's actually happening in the field of AI. It looks like it's advancing rapidly, but that's not quite what's happening. What's really happening is there's been an area of breakthrough, probably about 10 or 15 years ago, around a field that is called machine learning. So let me be a little bit more specific. You can take the digital information that's, say, streaming from a camera or appears in a picture, and, uh, or coming from a microphone, and you can now extract out of that uh, information you previously couldn't get. So previously, machines were blind and they couldn't hear. But now, because of this new technology, we can equip them with what we think of as sensory perception. Welcome. It is a pleasure to meet you. I like your pink scrunchie. Or is it a bow? Oh, it's very nice. So the perception for the general public is that the field is breaking rapid progress. But what's really happening is there's a new tool, and that tool is being applied to lots and lots of different areas. That might be speech recognition. That might be self-driving cars. Uh, that might be uh, uh, interpreting x-rays to look at whether or not you have uh, cancerous growth, for example. Excellent. It's going to impact a lot of areas of our life, but really, qualitatively, it'll be similar to what happened in the past with the computer revolution. If you think about things like, how has your smartphone affected your life? Well, it's really affected all kinds of aspects of your life, many, many different ways. And so this new technology is probably going to have an impact that will be analogous to like that of the internet or of uh, smartphones. And so it's going to have a broad impact. But the truth is, as a consumer, you don't need to know about the technology. You don't have to worry about the technology. You'll just find that, oh, I didn't know a computer could do that. So the question is, what does that mean for people's jobs? Well, like every previous wave of automation, it does replace people in certain kinds of jobs. But more accurately, it allows us to automate certain kinds of tasks. So many things that people required people to do previously, now we'll be able to do either with the assistance of a machine or it can be done completely by the machine itself. 
And that might sound scary. It's like, my God, it's going to take away all our jobs. But you just have to look back in history to realize that this constant change in the labor force and the skills that we need and the ways in which we uh, make a living always evolve. And it evolves in response to our ability to automate those mm -hmm. tasks. You talking about artificial intelligence? Sure, yeah. Was it worry me? Ah, not so far. But then again, you never know, right? I mean, it's basically once you become self-aware, that's when I'm going to be worried about it. Right now, I'm OK. It's just enough if I can program my phone, you know? Forget that. But artificial intelligence, who knows? One of these days, maybe they'll have my job. That's when I'm going to get upset. Jerry, a follow-up question. Um, for the people who are in the industries that will be displaced, what can we do as a society to help them out? Or what can they do themselves uh, today to help themselves out? Well, the main thing we can do is to make sure that we're teaching people the skills that will be valued by employers in the future. And that is certainly going to shift in part due to artificial intelligence. But let me provide a little bit of comfort on this. The image in the public is that the robots are coming and they're going to take my job. Well, for most jobs, we can't build a robot that does, <laughs> does that person's job. But what kinds of jobs are we not going to automate? Jobs that involve a lot of personal interaction or face-to-face -face contact. Nobody wants to go to a bar after work and tell all their troubles to an electronic bartender. <laughs> they want to have a human being to serve them. So I think it will make the provision of personal service and jobs that involve persuasion, where the expression of empathy or other forms of human emotion, it'll make those jobs more valuable. And the jobs of the future will go to the people who have good social skills, who can be good salespeople, or who can uh, give, be a good tour guide of some kind, or otherwise provide advice on a person-to-person -person basis. And so that's where we need to put more time and effort into making sure that we're not training people to operate machines for which we're going to build machines to do those jobs. Uh, what we need to do is to train them to have better social skills and to uh, be able to interact in, in the kinds of human professions that are going to dominate in the future. Walking amongst the giant redwoods of the Californian coast, I thought about my journey from Silicon Valley to the Caucasus, from Europe to China. We cannot develop AI from a place of greed or try to stop it out of fear. Instead, we need to take inspiration from nature and always hold a strong sense of empathy. Because AI is going to impact each and every human being. So everyone deserves to stand and be recognized. The planet belongs to our children. The only question is what kind of world will we leave them?